there. So Dr. Renz, I didn't get a chance to introduce formally, but he is a PhD researcher who um, has been um, really at the forefront of investigating this and has been uh, a big part of the leadership of the uh, Michigan Spine Surgery Collaborative um, and has given a lot of talks on this. He was formerly, I believe, at Henry Ford for some time, right? Yeah, this is true. Um, I really appreciate the chance to share some of this with you tonight. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, and as Dr. Osborne said, this, for me personally, uh, this is home territory. I've been doing work on the area, particularly of racial and ethnic disparities and quality of care for over 30 years now. Um, and the opportunity just arose a little more recently in the context of MISIC. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how, uh, how that arose, what we're doing. If we look at the title here, one of the things I want to emphasize is the go together part of this, with the idea that quality improvement and work on health equity are not two different things. They're not two competing things. They're one thing. And we're trying to bring them to life in our collaborative as one thing. Um, why now? Uh, this really goes back four years now. Um, the George Floyd murder uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, uh, raise the visibility of the issue of uh, disparities in equity. Uh, and in the same year, the higher COVID incidence rates and mortality rates among African-Americans uh, had the same effect. So uh, even though this is something that's been on my personal radar screen for a very long time, um, it gained national attention. And there was a presidential directive then in 2020 uh, making equity a key goal uh, across the whole range of federal programs, healthcare and, and non-healthcare. Um, so we see it in a lot of the work that we do, um, and it uh, and was uh, a request that was made to the CQIs in Michigan. Now, what we're doing uh, in, in MISIC um, is uh, to focus specifically on spine surgery outcomes. So we're not, we don't have broader objectives than that. We're using the, uh, the registry, we're using the concepts and tools of quality improvement to, first of all, to identify, but then move as quickly as we can to reduce or eliminate uh, disparities uh, in important surgical outcomes. And everything we're doing, at least at the moment, is at the hospital level. I will show you a few background things that come from analysis of collaborative wide data, uh, but we're trying to move quickly to the hospital level because quality improvement, uh, at least in our context, uh, happens at that level. So we don't assume from the beginning that all hospitals would do the same thing. We don't assume from the beginning that all hospitals will see the, even the same opportunity or need. Um, the need, the opportunity, the mechanisms of improvement, the opportunities for improvement, we believe are gonna be different hospital by hospital. So our, our focus very much is uh, hospital specific. And again, I'll emphasize, we try to weave this into the overall agenda, not to make it a separate um, standalone activity. Okay, um, we started, this, this is uh, an early example, last year's example in August uh, of a hospital level dashboard. Obviously it's not as pretty as some dashboards, including others of our own. We'll make it prettier as we go forward. We'll have time trends, we'll have bar charts, we'll have other things. Uh, but there are a few things I'll mention here because I'll show you a couple more versions of this as we go along. Um, we have uh, in the top set of panels, uh, a couple of abstracted variables. We have ED visits and we have 30 day readmissions. We also have uh, in the, the bottom set of panels, um, outcomes that come from our patient surveys. Uh, the uh, promised physical function scale, uh, there's opioid use, uh, there's, uh, there's pain. And, and what you see are the percents who meet a minimally clinical improvement uh, level of difference. Um, and the one thing I'll mention here, because you'll see it again, so the, the rows are outcomes uh, upon which we could see disparities. The columns are stratifying variables. Uh, so in the light blue, a little more to the left, you'll see their area deprivation index. On the next slide, I'll tell you a little more about that. Uh, we have age, uh, three levels of stratification, and then we have race uh, on the right side. That, that was our starting point last summer. Um, there's a color code for what you see here. The red is what we uh, think are meaningful or significant disparities that a hospital may want to pay attention to. It's a combination of the size of the disadvantaged group, 50 or more, and a 20% relative difference. Now, both of these are somewhat arbitrary. We may move from these, but that's what we started with. Um, 
The orange is the same size difference, but a smaller target group, meaning that there's a maybe factor to this. You might want to pay attention, but uh, it, it issue a small sample. Um, the gray font uh, is something where the numbers are so small, we don't suggest people pay attention to it. And then the black is essentially a no disparity situation. Also, we uh, have a, co a color code doesn't appear in this slide of blue for a reverse disparity, where a group that is otherwise typically disadvantaged is actually doing better. Um, and we want to draw attention to those because we may want to learn from those. But the, this is a specific hospital. It's not hypothetical. It's not named in this example, but this is uh, real data from a real hospital. Uh, and this is the first thing that we showed our folks um, last August. Now, Area Deprivation Index uh, is publicly available. It's maintained at the University of Wisconsin. We like it because it's a neighborhood level index. It's kind of a broad SES. It's go along with what you think intuitively about a really nice, good neighborhood versus a, a poor neighborhood. 17 component variables. Um, if you see the color code map, that's the Detroit metropolitan area. Uh, the dark red shading uh, in neighborhood level, uh, most deprived, dark blue, least deprived, shades in between. Um, it can range on a continuous scale from zero to 100. Uh, it also uh, can appear in, in deciles. Uh, based on work I've done with this in the past, uh, including collaboration with Amy Kine and her group, uh, we look at the 85th percentile uh, as an at-risk group and then all else, that because statistically that's where the influence seems to be. Okay, so when you look at this for the first time, you start uh, immediately get some questions. Uh, are the effects that you see ADI? Are the effects race? If you see one, does that really reflect the other? Uh, what about the general concept of risk adjustment? If you see an effect of ADI or race or age, is it really that on its face or is that a, a marker for something like uh, comorbidity? Is it a marker for duration of symptoms? Is it duration for something else? Um, so one of the very first things we did uh, was risk adjustment. So this is uh, version two from last November. Um, you'll see we just kind of, the abstracted variables are now on the left, patient survey variables are now on the right. You'll notice age has been taken away as a stratifying variable. That's because the statistical risk, at least in our context for age, is at 80 and above. And we couldn't find any hospitals that had enough patients 80 and above to make it worthwhile. Um, so we took that out. We have ADI and race now. Uh, the race comparison is black, white, at least uh, our sense of the state of Michigan, our own data, those are the two groups where the numbers are adequate. Um, and again, the same color coding. Here you do see an illustration of the blue that I talked about a little earlier, where actually it's a it's a reverse disparity. Um, and in this case, uh, actually uh, quite good performance, uh, where not only are the overall rates low, but the African-American rates lower than the white rate. So this is the kind of place uh, that we want to look at as an example. But what this shows, that it, as you'll see, if you look, say, in the uh, left upper, we have ED visits at unadjusted and adjusted. And in this particular example, doesn't make much difference. But we, adjust, we have a, a set of close to two dozen variables that we adjust for. We have complex adjustment models. And so now what people got in November were these kind of things where if they had any question about whether an ADI effect or a race effect was really that versus something else, this would begin to speak to that question. So this is what our folks got in November and we asked them to begin to think about what they could do. Um, and I, this is again, the, the, the same slide basically, but here I showed with highlighting um, this concept that we've had in the red font about meaningful disparities. Um, and the point I'll make here is that when we apply the risk adjustment in this particular example, it doesn't move things very much. Red is still red. A big difference is still a big difference. Moves a little bit. Um, you, you know, the the afraid I, I don't have the equivalent of a laser pointer, um, but uh, you see for in the ADI columns, for example, um, ED visits unadjusted is 5.4 versus 13.3. You apply complex risk adjustment. It shrinks a little bit, 6.8 to 11.4, but by our standard, it's still a meaningful difference. So it's still red. Now, in a couple of examples, risk adjustment can make a difference. Uh, in the left panel here, uh, a difference has gone from a red color code to just normal uh, a black color code. It just shifted a little bit over the line of uh, the 20% relative. 
Um, that can happen sometimes. Um, and also in the one on the right, um, the difference got smaller. It's still red, um, but it got kind of noticeably smaller. So again, these, these effects are hospital specific. So when you apply a risk adjustment model, it can have an effect on one variable, on one stratifying uh, issue at one hospital, but may not have that same effect somewhere else. So everything's hospital specific. So summary, uh, risk adjustment in general didn't make a difference, but we wanted to do it just so people were comfortable to say, if they're seeing a disparity, it's real. It's not a, a, a marker or reflection of something else. Um, so for example, it's not that the patients are sicker, it's not that they're older. Um, now, one thing we have to say, we have a few things in the risk adjustment model that we really think may be important mediating factors uh, as opposed to purely confounding factors. So we wanna look at sort of carefully what happens when a, a, a difference moves or doesn't move with the effect of adjustment because we don't wanna lose sight of, of an important factor, of a mediating factor. If risk adjustment makes a difference go away, but the thing that matters is a causal mediating factor that we can intervene on, we wanna know that, we don't wanna lose sight of that. Um, and at the bottom, ADI and race are really two independent things in our data. It's not that they're, they're just two reflections of the same thing, they are independent. If you adjust for one uh, in, in looking at the other, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it doesn't make it go away, two different things. Now, I should say the reason we got into this is when we look at the data for our hospitals, we have 30-ish hospitals in MISIC, only about five or six have enough African-American patients that it's, you get stable data when you look at these things and it's worthwhile to do quality improvement to uh, go after a disparity. We don't want to go to work on this and have 25 out of 30 hospitals sitting on the sidelines watching everybody else. ADI brings many, many more hospitals into the mix. Marquette, for example, not a lot of African-American patients up here, which is where I happen to live, um, but there are a lot of poor people. Um, and a lot of deprived neighborhoods. So Marquette General can be in this looking at ADI, but not looking at race. So we want to have as many hospitals in this as we can. Okay, so more recently, uh, this is now uh, April of this year, version three, we now got into the question of stability over time because people would say, well, maybe what we're looking at is just a one-time thing. Maybe it comes and then next year it goes away. So what we're able to do now is show them, uh, and I've circled here, uh, for a time period in 22, also a time period in 23, and hospitals can see, is, is it the same or different? Is it here? And actually, in this case, red is red. Um, the problem is present uh, in both, uh, we have ED visits um, in 22, we have ED visits in 23, we have it as a function of ADI, we have it as a function of race. It's red all the time, uh, didn't change. And what you're gonna see here, and now I'm gonna carry forward, uh, we're focusing pretty strongly for the moment on ED visits uh, as our outcome that we want to take action on. Part of the reason for that, A, we see a lot of disparities, but B, it's part of the larger overall high priority QI agenda for us for this year and next year. So this is part of my example of weaving it into the larger agenda. We don't want to go off in a separate direction. We want people to go to work on disparities as part of a larger initiative about reducing ED visits. Okay, so that's that's what we've uh, done in the dashboards. We do see uh, meaningful disparities. We see it in two different time periods. Um, we we ask people to think about a sort of a conceptual distinction between, let's uh, say, a reason for ED visit, like why that day did that patient go to the ED, and there's and for us it's largely pain. I'll show you a little more of that in a minute, but also then some of these. Uh, risk factors, mediating factors, and I'll illustrate some of that. But the, the two things are a little different conceptually. Um, we have data in our registry. Why do people go to the ED? Uh, we record this at 30 days. We record it at 90 days. Uh, pain, two different types of pain are, are the main reason. Uh, there are also some abdominal issues, uh, including even things like constipation that we believe uh, can be opioid related. So some opioid initiatives that we have may have an effect on that. And we also want to look at equity and disparities in that context. Now, step back a little bit. Why does anybody go to the ED? Well, sometimes it's a true medical emergency, but sometimes it's a problem that could be managed in urgent care. So when we look at our data 
and we have hospitals look at the data, we want them to think about both of those things. Um, and, and both of them may be relevant. We think what's happening is, is largely the second category, largely things that perhaps could be managed in urgent care, primary care, uh, perhaps a phone call to the surgeon. These are not typically life-threatening emergencies, um, but that uh, actually gives us probably some broader opportunity uh, for intervention. But immediately begin to think about what can you do to give people a different avenue um, than going to the ED, and then how might that be different in some way for high ADI? Maybe part of the deal if you live in a high DI neighborhood is you don't have a strong primary care network nearby. And then maybe we can figure out how to do something about that. Um, and we see some factors uh, in the bottom that we're paying attention to, unstable housing, food insecurity, living alone. Um, a number of these um, actually are very plausible uh, risk factors that are themselves mediating factors, meaning these are things we can uh, possibly intervene on. Um, in our own data, we published on this a uh, number of papers. Um, it, you can probably read it faster than I can talk. Uh, black patients compared to white patients, uh, more undiagnosed empty to depression, more possible malnutrition, more being single, living alone, lack of social support. A surprise to us recently as we started to get into this, far more likely to have emergency surgery versus planned, which means you have less time to do your pre-surgical prep less time to do your hemoglobin E1C optimization, less time for a lot of things. Um, so uh, we're looking at this. This is a screenshot of, from just if you do a standard query to our registry, illustrates a couple of things. Now this is collaborative wide, but a hospital can do the same thing for its own data. Um, what you see on the top, I, I think you can read the question, was the patient admitted emergency? Uh, 15 plus percent of black patients, 7% of white patients. We think that's a difference that may matter. We're looking into that. And that difference could be even exaggerated at some hospitals. Um, now, it's interesting. You don't see the difference as you drop to the second question and getting some sort of spine surgery class. But the difference is white patients are far more likely to get that class in person uh, instead of online in some fashion, uh, particularly virtual. Uh, and we think maybe that's a difference that we should pay attention to. And then we look in the bottom panel, uh, this is the issue of just marital status. Uh, black patients far more likely to be single, which we don't know for sure, but we think is a marker for living alone, which in turn reflects the broader concept, lack of social support. We're exploring this now in more detail. So this is all analysis. How do we move to action? How can we identify some of these factors that actually now become amenable to tangible quality improvement? Um, we can just take an example here of living alone. Why might that matter? Uh, well, you don't have somebody to help you uh, with things like lifting, things like bending and tying your shoes that can cause problems. Uh, you don't have somebody who can take good care of a wound that's on your lower back that you can't see or reach. Um, the, there are a number of things that may lead to pain, which then if not managed early and quickly could lead to an ED visit um, or similar perhaps problem with PCP. These are the kind of questions we're asking individual hospitals to look into and we're helping them with data analysis. Um, if we find, for example, uh, that living alone is an issue just in the domain of post-discharge care, you could do uh, increased home visits, you could do meals on wheels if you find that nutrition is part of the overall picture. Um, you can help as you deal with people pre-discharge to identify friends, neighbors, others who can come by and help out. These are just examples of possibilities, but all of them seem to be within the standard sort of typical domain of what our folks know how to do um, under the label of quality improvement. Um, and I, I gave a couple examples, um, but there are other things. We, we want to look into this question of undiagnosed, untreated depression. We have data suggests it might be a factor transportation, lack of PCP relationship. But again, what I, I point out about all these, these are not change the world kind of issues. These are tangible things that hospital-based folks working under the label of quality improvement can address. So May 17th, um, we had one of our regular abstractor symposiums. This was held in Grand Rapids. Um, and what we did uh, when we had them together, and a lot of these folks, not only are the abstractors, but they serve double duty as our QI leads. Uh, and sometimes we have separate QI leads who come to the same meeting. Um, 
All of them, again, were given their hospital-specific data, the most recent versions, and they'd seen already a couple of different versions of this before. The difference now between this meeting and what we did collaborative-wide in April is now we're asking them to start planning action, to start planning quality improvement. And we had them do it uh, in the form of dividing them into three different discussion groups based on the kind of patterns their data showed. I'll show you that in just a second. But what we asked for are four or five hospitals who are enough interested, enough willing to start doing something this year to carry into next year as well. Um, divided into three groups. The A group are the ones who have real problems to talk about. They have a meaningful disparity and they have high overall rates. Again, the focus here is on uh, ED occurrences. And I, I, I use the term occurrences because we count if the same patient goes to the ED three, four, five times, that gets counted as opposed to the way if you just count at the patient level and say, did you have one or more? Because we think if we can intervene on a patient who has three, four, five visits, we may be able to eliminate all of those visits um, and, and take some uh, statistical credit for all of them. We'll see. Um, the, uh, the second group had no meaningful disparity, but an overall high rate. Um, the third group had a meaningful disparity, but a relatively low rate. And you'll notice the absence of a fourth group, but that actually existed as well. Those were kind of our, our blue font model citizens. These were people who had no disparity or even a reverse disparity and a low rate. These are the people we have a different kind of discussion, not about how they're going to work with quality improvement to solve a problem, but what might they be doing already that they can teach others about uh, as, as best practices. Um, now, this is the one I'm going to skip over, but this is it's sort of the, the, the discussion template uh, that we gave to folks in these groups. What are the information would you like? Uh, we showed them, uh, uh, again, some of their own data now as opposed to the collaborative wide data on things like the reasons for ED visits, a little deeper dive uh, into some of what's going on. So we not only showed them the dashboards, but we showed them some additional information at their own hospital level that might help them understand uh, a little better. And then asked them to address questions uh, like you see here on the left, including what sort of people would you need to get together to start making improvements? Um, this slide, again, I'll skip a little detail. The focus here is sort of on the right. We promised to folks that they would get support from the coordinating center, but the level of support would vary as a function of what group they were in. Um, we would prioritize uh, analytic and consulting support for group A. Uh, we'll also help group B, but they, their needs, we think, are going to be a little different, less. Um, group C, uh, similarly. So we just wanted to pe make people understand we would support them as much as we could, but our analytic resources are finite and we want to prioritize those resources to the places, first of all, that are committed to take action, but also where we think there's a greater opportunity to really make a difference and improve things. Um, so we, in, as I mentioned briefly in passing, in our 2025 paper performance, ED occurrences is one of the priority items. Um, and as, as you've seen, and I've said, uh, disparities are present uh, in the ED arena, so these things fit together. So our little graphic here is just to try to show weaving threads together, that there's an overall set of objectives, there's some equity-based objectives, and they ultimately funnel to the same endpoint, and that's the way we want to have it. Now, uh, see, we ever done this before? Well, yes, actually. Um, this is a project I did. Um, Quite a long time ago, 2007, it was based on Health Alliance Plan. So now we're talking about some work done at the plan level, not the hospital level. And this is long before NISIC, uh, long before uh, the, the number of the, the state collaborators came in, although not all, but some are older than this. Um, health plans uh, have a data set of performance measures uh, whose acronym name is HEDIS. Uh, many of the folks here may be familiar with that. Um, it's a lot of process variables, a lot of primary care-based variables, screening variables, things like that. Um, and we were able to uh, import uh, data on race ethnicity into HAP. They'd not had it before. Uh, we analyzed data. We observed a 10% disparity between black and white women and mammography rates. So that's not acceptable. What are we going to do? Uh, we found, first of all, just because of the way people come into HAP, their benefit packages, 
Uh, the problem was primarily among the salaried versus hourly employees. We didn't know that uh, before, but it was true. Uh, we then did a set of focus groups. We made some phone calls. We did a number of things to try to research the problem. Um, we gained a couple of insights from that. Um, we made some changes uh, in policy and process. And in the next year of measurement, that disparity was gone. Um, and I mentioned this uh, because, and I, I mentioned this to our abstractors. I've used this slide for our abstractors. Many times they're intimidated um, because you know, when you talk about racial disparities, particularly, um, it's a touchy issue and people are nervous about it. And they think, well, what, what am I, can, what can I do about that? It's deep, it's profound, it's long lasting. And what we've tried to indicate is it doesn't have to be so. That if you can understand the underlying reasons, those underlying reasons lend themselves to quality improvement. May not be so, but at least you can start with that set of assumptions and go forward until Somehow it seems you can't. So that's really the approach we're taking. We look for underlying reasons. We believe they're there. Our data tell us they're there. We then try to identify hospital level uh, quality improvement opportunities using the absolute standard concepts and tools of quality improvement. And we see if we can make a difference. And if we try something that doesn't work, we'll try something else. And if that doesn't work, we'll try a third thing. And we're going to keep going until these disparities are gone. That is the goal. Um, 